Uh, so why don't we start here and then go over here um, and then back. Well, again, uh, I'm Dr. Richard Smith. I'm um, one of the vice presidents of Henry Ford Hospital, the one who's sponsoring this event here today. I'm a longtime member of the, of the NMA. In fact, they gave me one of those old-time badges. I, don't, I think they gave me the wrong one. They said 40 <laughs> years. I thought that was a little bit unusual, uh, that sort of thing. I'm also the past president of the Michigan State Medical Society as well. Um, I, I enjoyed your comments. I particularly enjoyed your comments. I think they were exceptional. Uh, the Kellogg Foundation is in Battle Creek, and in Battle Creek, Michigan, there's a highway that runs through Battle Creek, and it's called the Sojourner Truth Highway. State of fact. Sojourner Truth. That's the, the basis for where Kellogg and where they come from. To give you an idea, it symbolizes our connection to the Underground Railroad, which was the first civil rights movement that existed in this country, which existed right here in Detroit. You guys have looked out across the river right through there? That's Canada. That's, right. That's freedom. That's, right. That's freedom. Before they get there, they had to come to Detroit. They did. They had to come to Detroit. And it was through a nucleus of leaders, young leaders, who did all that stuff. They took the risk. They took the organization, and they funded the organization in order not 100, not 200, not 300 fugitive slaves like, like, like um, Sojourner Truth or from, from Harriet Tubman, but 50,000 of them came to Detroit, went across that river, sat by the casino where there was an old barracks by the British where they got a field hospital to take care of them before they established communities in Chatham and other places, Buxton, all right across the river. That was the original one and it had its basis in healthcare as well. So I appreciate your comments and all the great things that your organization has been doing. I enjoyed your comments too. I'm a gold blue person as well. And I'm a child of BAM if you understand what I'm talking about. Yes. That stays with us. We don't have to say anything else, but you understand what I'm talking about. That's correct. Another movement of students, young students, leaders, who went ahead and opened the doors. The word was open it up or shut it down. And they opened it up not for Michigan, but then to the Big Ten, but then through the United States. That's what occurred at Michigan, and they're still fighting that fight there. But it took young student leaders. This is a room full of leaders. All of us are leaders here. That's why we're here. We're listening how to get better. And the mentoring that you talked about is very important too. The question I have is this. We've done a lot of stuff in these hmm, 40 years, but when you say, hey, listen, we got a position on the March of Dimes board. Can you want to do it? Doc, I ain't got time for that. You know, I got play, you know, I play tennis on there. I got a golf game coming up. I don't have time for that. We got a position on the maternity mortality board at the state of Michigan. Uh, you want to do that? Well, Doc, you know, I'm, I'm going to Vegas this weekend. I can't do all that. We got the National Medical Association in Detroit. Are you coming down? Oh, no, I don't have time for that. You know, it's just a bunch of old doctors. How do we reach out to a younger generation of people to give them that inspiration? We don't need it here. We're here listening to you. What do you do to inspire your young leaders or young physicians, particularly, to say this is now your turn to lead? That's my question. So I'll address the board issue because I have the opportunity to appoint people to boards. Um, I don't find a problem recruiting young physicians to boards. What I have found is that people who are in my position who have the opportunity to appoint young physicians to boards don't start with them or provide them the opportunity. They are trying to always look for the person who has 25, 30, 40 years of experience in the field to be on the board. Um, what I have tried to champion, especially for boards that are working boards, that need to issue reports, that need to have policy positions, is trying to express to people that you need some members of your board who can do the work of the board. And the people who will do that are young physicians who are still trying to advance their careers. And I believe if there were more people who, when they are being asked to serve on boards, who, and I'll, because I like to be frank, so I, I think we can do that in this room. There are people who don't, who accept seats on boards who don't actively participate. And they are those 25 and 30 year old career folk who just simply show up to the quarterly meetings, don't do any work in between, and have to get into the position of passing that baton, freeing up that space to a more junior person who would actually participate actively in those experiences. So I do think that there are opportunities for people. Um, now, what does that mean? 
Young physicians are not going to continuously show up where they don't have any authority and any responsibility. They may be finding those opportunities in other places other than the NMA. They may be finding them in their specialty organizations. They may be finding them in their institutions where they may not be advancing as quickly and then eventually just give up on it altogether um, and no longer be categorized as young physicians. But they are not going to consistently show up in places and spaces where they are are never going to be given an opportunity to have any authority or any responsibility. The only, the, the only thing I would add to that, um, I 100% agree with the, the comments you made about the leadership. The one thing I would add is, as young physicians are coming out and um, they're becoming more established in their careers, there's conversations like this about how to become a leader, how to um, uh, manage um, uh, an, an organization. Conversations like this need to happen and having more uh, of a curriculum focus around these type of um, uh, conversations would be beneficial to the younger professionals that are out there because I think a lot of the information that they're getting specific to their practice or their field uh, is coming from the specialty organization. So you have to come up with a different curriculum that's going to be more enticing for those younger physicians to come out and participate in the NMA. You know, that's, so, that's such a good point. I'll just interject. Um, I was at my subspecialty organization meeting um, a couple of months ago, and I mentioned the NMA meeting coming up to the younger group, or whatever you call it, the young council, or whatever it's called, we call ourselves. Um, and no one was coming um, because they just didn't think it was relevant to what they were doing. And so I think there are some real challenges that we face in terms of creating spaces that people feel energized and relevant around. Uh, but, sir, Thank you very much, uh, and again, I con congratulate all of you for an excellent job on this panel, and it's certainly wonderful to have heard uh, Joan's uh, wonderful remarks uh, earlier, but um, this is my uh, 42nd year in the NMA. My first, uh, my first uh, NMA meeting was uh, in 1974, or excuse me, 73. And uh, I was, while th listening to your presentations, uh, thinking about what advice would I have given to that guy who attended that meeting in that year, or what advice would I now have, or what I would have given to my 40-year-old self? Uh, you guys are plus minus uh, the, that age, and, and what would I have done differently in the, in the years since then until now? And so and thinking about your next steps, and you should be doing that. The day you get your current job is the day you should be thinking about what your next job is going to be, because everything you do in your current job will lead you to whatever that next role will, will be. I would tell my 40-year-old self to be more gregarious. Uh, it goes back to what's something that uh, Joan said. The, the people that are going to make decisions about you uh, want to feel connected to you, and sometimes we undervalue that informal social connections. I got invited to play golf so many times that I can't even remember it. I never took anybody up on it. I, I got invited to, to parties. I got invited to those social events that allow people to understand who you are as a person, a bit more comfortable with you as a person as opposed to uh, your role as a physician or a leader. And, and that social connection, which, he was, which Joan was talking about with respect to who gets promoted, on faculties is, is that sort of nebulous but very important component that allows people to then recommend you or think about you when considering who's going to take over for X, Y, and Z. So my advice to you is, is not necessarily learn how to play golf, uh, but, but take advantage of those opportunities to meet informally with people to get to know them a little bit. That's what I would have told my 40-year-old my uh, self, and if I had followed that advice, who knows, I might have actually got a few more things done. Thank well, you very much. Before you go, um, tell, a little, tell folks a little bit about the things that you did get done. Um, I think you are, um, your advice is relevant, but more importantly, coming from all the vast array of experiences you had and are currently having. I, I don't really wish to take, I mean, there's questioners <laughs> at the line here that have very, I, I've done a lot of different things in my career. I've been involved in a lot of different uh, leadership roles in medicine, public health, and politics, and a whole variety of things. And, and I think in all of those areas consistently, if, if, you know, if, I, if I could have taken that just with one extra step, who knows what, what else I would have uh, been able to accomplish. But it's a, it's a, it's a journey, and you've got to enjoy it. And, 
but you got to get out there and, uh, and even though you don't necessarily want to go to that luncheon or <laughs> even though you don't necessarily want to get up for that breakfast or even though you don't necessarily want to get up on that and, and take that early morning flight that's what I, I I would tell you you've got to do you got to get on the airplane you got to go to the luncheon you got to go to the breakfast you got to go to the meeting you got to show up uh, and when you show up and people see that you care and they get to know you as a person that's when all kinds of doors will open up for you that that I, I think will lead you to your next adventure your next journey and all of you have incredible adventures and journeys awaiting awaiting you and I just wish you all the best I would just like to, to reinforce we, we have this saying among peers in the foundation we say the relationship is primary and all else is derivative now in the world of racial hierarchy that we're still functioning in, as Dr. Reed's data showed us so clearly, people still have to vouch for us. And so once again, those relationships, not only with our peers who are African American or are quote minority, but those relationships across lines are absolutely critical for that person informally to vouch for us when the decisions are being made about who gets the promotion or who gets the job. So I really appreciate your point. I think it's extremely valid. Very good point. And though I don't want to underestimate the, the doors you have opened and the things you have accomplished in your career from the, from the state level to the corporate world, to everything that you're continuing to do. So um, I wanted to thank you for everything that you've done. <coughs> Kamara, please. Yes, I want to... Um, lift up Dr. Gail Christopher for the clarity that you continue to have about racism and the importance of us naming and addressing racism as a threat to the health and well-being of the nation and to observe that for young people, maybe we haven't um, done our job in terms of teaching history or whatever. I had a very interesting conversation with a 35-year-old colleague who said, oh my God, her mind was blown with all of these, you know, now the cell phone and body cam photos, and now, you know, in the Black Lives Matter movement, and this was their time, and they thought that the civil rights movement had solved everything, and I'm looking at her, and I'm like, oh, we did not do a good job. <laughs> we did not do a good job if she thought at 35, that everything was okay. Now that means, of course, that she came from a certain social segment where opportunities had opened up for her. It means that she, along with others who, who thought that the election of President Obama meant the elimination of racism, I mean, she was in that, but now she knows. But what I want to say is I know that many in your generation think you know your brilliance, and you think that you got where you are because of your brilliance. Not realizing that there have been centuries of brilliant people in this country who could not get anywhere. And that, that, we have, that we are standing and you are standing on the shoulders of others. You need to stand tall, as all of you said, so that others can stand on your shoulders. You need to reach back. But also, don't be blinded to the reality that racism is very alive and well in this society and this is the core thing that we need to do because it is a threat to the health and well-being of the nation. So I just, I, I want to thank you for your cl clarity and for your infusion of thought and funding and all in this and I want to ask you guys, like did you know that or when did you learn it? Or what, I want to hear from you, are you like my 35 year old colleague who is surprised or what? Tell I'm from good. Flint, Michigan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Keeping it real. So I, that's going to be my brief comment. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> so, um, so for me, my parents um, grew up in segregated Texas, uh, and I heard stories about how um, my my dad recounts the first time he saw a white person and he was 10 and he talks about the uh, experiences he had in college um, uh, at the school he went to. My mom talks about her experiences. So I've, I've had this um, exposure for a while and then uh, you're, you said you went to Flint. I went to Prairie View A&M University 
And um, it's, uh, this type of discussion is a part of the, the, the culture at Prairie View. And uh, so I've, I've been exposed to this uh, the discussion about race and, uh, and opportunities um, because of race or lack thereof, and then also uh, the importance of having strong leaders coming from um, uh, communities, especially like you mentioned, the HBCUs, because of uh, they've opened so many doors for, for students like myself. Uh, so this is not something that is new to me, certainly not an uh, eye-opener. Uh, it's just a, a continuance of the disappointment um, of um, the um, non-continuous uh, progress that we've had in this country. So I was born and raised in the South and went to uh, HBCU in the South, so I'm well, well aware of the problems. But I'll well, I, I, you know, I will, I'll elaborate a little bit on that I, because I've actually worked in two different um, types of urban communities where the leadership of those communities have looked different. Um, and so where policy decisions are being made, I can speak to where there is a clear um, manifestation of people not having this type of experience or where you can actually see that there are people in this 25 to 35 year old space who don't really have an appreciation for um, differences and opportunities and not necessarily just related to race but also related to classism and not being able to have an appreciation for uh, what variation in social class has done among racial and ethnic minorities. And so it, it, because of that, there is this constant need to have this conversation about the impact on race and ethnicity and the impact of class in a very overt way uh, on, on health. And so it has become a responsibility in these roles um, as my part of my thing is to close the chasm between clinical medicine and public health, right? And talk about this larger construct of population medicine and population health and having this big opportunity with all that's changing, right? With healthcare reform and health reform and, and um, taking advantage of this opportunity that may never present itself again. But if we don't put these issues on the front forefront of people's minds that it's not just about universal access for people who um, we could pretend as if we've blinded ourselves to these issues of race and class, everybody's gonna shake out um, on the same side on the end. I constantly use this so slide about the differences between equality and equity. Um, and people get very comfortable with equality, but not so much when we have to start talking about equity. So I, we, ha we do have this responsibility, and I, I, I make the Flint, Michigan comment tongue in cheek because I think people look at my credentials and everything and have this, they forget, you know, I'm a blue collar kid. My parents worked for GM and retired. All three of my sisters and I have doctoral degrees. And so they don't necessarily have an appreciation that I would understand these things, but it's part of what drives me to do the work. So you asked a very real question, is that why the three of us are here? It very, may, very well may be. Um, and do people think that their brilliance is why they got here? I don't know that that's a universal yes, but I do think that if we begin to accept that as the answer, we could find ourselves in a very dangerous place in the future. Thank you. I'm sorry, say that again? Well said, exactly. Very nicely done. So here's a, the time check. Um, we are almost at the time where we'd end the session. I would like to ask for permission to go for 10 minutes more. Um, I wanted to be explicit in asking for that permission because I think we have a lot of good energy that I don't want to dissipate and then spend um, <clears throat> the last minute or two talking through um, what I would like to see in terms of some potential next steps from this group. So given that we have 10, 12 minutes or so, <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you all to, to do um, comments or, or question um, to keep it to about a minute or two so we can get everybody that's up here and then kind of close appropriately. Is that reasonable? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Please, ma'am. Okay. My name is Stacy Hunt and I'm from actually a native of Detroit and uh, I now practice at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. And one of the things that I just wanted to mention because, you know, talking about hard work is that, um, you know, I really felt like once I had finished medical school and had done all the hard work, um, that, that that would really get me to where I wanted to go in my career. And what I found out after a time is that it, wa it was those unconscious biases that really 
kept me from reaching a lot of my goals that I had and that we weren't taught that when I was in medical school. So one of the things that I would like to even comment on is that maybe we should, you know, think about having some of that information passed to the medical students and the residents because a lot of times, a lot of us like myself and my husband, we're first generation physicians, so we didn't have those mentors to really talk to. So we really began to run into the glass ceiling for so many different reasons. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because we didn't have the integrity or the education. It was just because that glass ceiling was there and there were a lot of unconscious biases. And really teaching, and I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people leave the organization, not because they couldn't do the work, but because there were other things that stood in their way of being um, successful. Thank you. I'm an internal medicine physician in DC. I'm trained in health policy and I serve on the, uh, the Medicaid Pharmacy Committee for your sister agency, yes. Healthcare Finance, and also vice chair of the Health Information Exchange for your sister agency, having a little trouble getting into your agency. Um, but I think a more important question is DC has been driving out physicians from local government. They're no longer in your department or the sister department to, what, to a great degree that it used to be before. Um, so we're delighted to have you there. But I guess I'm curious as to how you, with all the busyness you have at being at the cabinet level for the mayor, how are you building contacts with local physicians and other community health folks mm -hmm. so that you've got a support structure that's helping you accomplish the things that you want to accomplish? So I'm on the talent acquisition plan. Mm -hmm. I actually have four or five physicians now in my department in senior leadership roles since wow. I came back in January um, and growing. So I endeavor to resolve the issue that you have just described and I'm working with my sister agency healthcare finance to help them uh, increase at their agency as well. So duly noted. Excellent. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I think going back to what I said earlier, um, we want to make sure that what we do here is discuss how we can help you and kind of help lift up all the, the, the roles in terms of everyone here today. So please. Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Maddox, and I am a psychiatrist and the medical director for the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. As we've talked a lot about mentorship in advancing our careers, I will say that my mentorship has come, you know, many times from African Americans, but some of the critical uh, advancement that's happened because of my mentorship has actually come from white females. I recall as a third year medical student being asked uh, by um, one of my attendings, um, about my experience with sexism. And, and that kind of baffled me because when I had negative experiences with, um, with senior attendings, it never occurred to me that it was sexism or ageism or anything. I just thought of it as racism. And so as we started to have um, the discussion about um, what that would even look like, because it had just never entered my mind, um, I remember her having, uh, uh, talking to a senior psychiatry resident who was calling all the women girls. And she had this conversation. And so what she said to me was um, she talked about how they would, you know, to call different one doctor, but when they talked to women, they would say Rhonda. Um, and so I had never noticed that. I just thought maybe they were calling me by my first name because we were familiar. And so my question, it's to the women. Sorry, guys, it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, even on the when, so now when I, I'm astutely aware, uh, or keenly aware, when people, when I'm in an audience and all of the men are referred to as doctor and the women are referred to by their first names, when that situation happens, I do not want to be considered an angry black woman, and so I I, I try to figure out how to navigate that um, terrain. Um, sometimes I do it in, a, in a, a sarcastic way, sometimes I do it in a very joking way, but how have you navigated that terrain when that happens and obviously everyone else is being um, recognized, sometimes very unconsciously, and in other times it is to discredit what you've done. What do you do? So I actually want to address that because I deal with that actually weekly at work. Um, <laughs> Um, at, in the department that I'm in, um, it's not, um, it's mostly African, it's mostly um, blacks, but um, 
it's black some other countries and and some of the men have ideas that women should do more secretarial or administrative things so when we're in faculty meetings they oftentimes look at the women in the room in the room and turn to us and ask us to take notes if the chair's assistant is available um, any tasks that we come up with regards to whether it's accreditation or anything related to um, research or students they turn and look at the women so one of the things I, I found myself doing is in a very polite way reminding them that they are being sexist and saying that there needs it, equally we need to take responsibility of tasks so um, it's, it's annoying and frustrating to deal with that um, like I said I deal with it weekly but it's a reality I would just say um, that it's sexism is is real it's it's part of the hierarchy of human value that we inherited from the 17th and 18th century uh, one of my most effective interventions in that space was you know if you're a woman and you make a comment often it will be repeated by some man in the room and then all the men in the room will say as John said you know whereas you had just said it but it was ignored right and so what I find my found myself doing at a very high level meeting one time was just to say, excuse me, is there an echo in this room or did I not just say that? And it was like immediately from that point on, because this was a commission that I was going to be a part of for a couple of years, after that it never happened again. And so I share that story to say that part of what, as you said so eloquently, what you have to do is you have to call it and you have to graciously stand up for who you are, and usually you get more respect as a result of having done that. And not necessarily as an angry black woman, but as a woman who has clear boundaries and has a deep understanding of who she is. Nice to said. All right, so we're officially four minutes over, and so we have room for one, two, three, four, five more comments at a minute and a half each. Okay. Hello. Um, <laughs> I just came up with that random math. I have no idea. Yeah. I'll keep it short, I promise. Uh, don't stick to it. Just do what you uh, want to do. Hi, Victoria <laughs> Golston here from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for uh, all your insight. It was uh, greatly appreciated and um, really, really, uh, really, really um, informative. My specific question is for uh, Dr. Nesbitt. I'm interested in um, the kind of environment that you are facing, assuming your new position at the DOH, and some of the limitations that you're currently um, dealing with. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, it's a political appointment. Uh, so I had the choice to take the job. Um, and had the opportunity to be interviewed and sort of interview at the same time uh, for the leader that I would be working with to make sure that our ideals and philosophies were aligned. So I don't feel as if I'm working, you know, sort of a square peg in a round hole or trying to work for a political figure for whom um, they don't sort of share the same views and perspectives that I do in terms of uh, health policy and public health. That being said, um, everyone's a politician uh, where I w work, uh, and everyone shows up to hearings. I have had hearings where there have been 72 public witnesses, and um, they don't always understand the public health or health care perspective or incentive for doing something. And um, this speaks to the question that was asked earlier in terms of if you don't have a team of people who are professionally trained in the field, and not just physicians, but public health professionals, and how that is broadly defined if you're not using data uh, to inform your position, and if you don't speak with a level of confidence and show up to hearings being able to have an informed position on an issue, you will get run over uh, immediately. And so in the first uh, six months, I think I've had eight hearings. Um, the first two weeks of July, I had four right before um, council went on recess. And so you have to have a team that's able to help inform that policy position so you don't get caught flat footed. Mm -hmm. So it's very rapid fire. You have to be data driven. You have to be able to have 
a collaborative pro approach working with council members who get who are get, maybe getting a lot of pressure from constituents that don't necessarily um, understand what the right things are to do and the some things that happen nationally or in other jurisdictions may not be a good fit for you locally and you have to be able to articulate that in a way that makes makes sense so I, I don't have the um, a disconnect from my um, superior leadership, but there's also this being able to manage and engage relationships at the community level. And you never have the balance of the people who support your position showing up in the same numbers as the people who oppose your position. <laughs> so that's just par for the course. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Good, good afternoon. Kimberly Dawn Wisdom, Senior Vice President of Community Health uh, and Equity and the Chief Wellness and Diversity Officer at Henry Ford Health System. Really enjoyed the panel very much. And I want to thank uh, Gail Christopher from Kellogg for all the support that their foundation has given related to childhood obesity across the state, as well as infant mortality reduction in the city of Detroit. But a very quick question, and I hope it's fairly provocative in terms of leadership and addressing the reduction and ultimate elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities. And it's related to another provider type. I have individuals coming to me probably 100 a year wanting to be mentored, talk to me about career paths and combining medicine and public health. And there is a great need, of course, for positions to help drive the elimination of disparities. So the notion of, and several of us are working on this across the country, of having state level surgeon generals in every state and territory to help drive down systematically uh, the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities and close that gap and have some accountability around that. So I just like the, the, the panel as much as you can to address that type of position and it would create more capacity for leadership positions for our upcoming young people and it will also systematically help us drive down the elimination of racial and ethnic health disparities. Thank you. I, th I mean, it, it sounds like a great concept. I think you have to have buy-in from the state leadership uh, in order to establish this position. Um, I think you have to have uh, a clear understanding of what their role is and how it interacts with the other parts of the government and making sure that they are able to do what they need to do and you're not just putting someone there as a figurehead and allowing them to actually have power uh, and money in order to enact those changes. Yeah, and, and I, I think part of, um, part of what we are sort of revamping or recreating our identity and um, with the DC department and um, the rebranding, I guess I'll say, with it in Louisville is what is the role even of a health commissioner or a health officer, right? A lot of times you get pigeonholed into this, you're a bureaucrat who operates a state agency and no one really looks at you from the perspective of influencing policy and setting a health agenda to advance you know, the um, health status of a community. You're sort of looked at as a social service agency. Um, and so I've kind of walk around with this moniker, we're more than healthcare for poor people. And making sure that people understand that it's not being meant in a disparaging way where we need to be the healthcare safety net, we absolutely will, but there's so much more we do for a community than that. And there's so much more that we advise the health policy makers or the policy makers in general in the jurisdictions that we work for, or we should be doing from my perspective, or the, why I take the jobs I take at least. So I, it, it then begs the question of, do we need to have a revisiting, and I know we do this in some of our health officials' meetings, do we need to have a revisiting of what the role of health officers are in our communities or at our state level, um, or, or a creation of this new uh, position and role? Um, so I, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. And unfortunately, guys, we're going to have to cut it off here as um, Cato just let me know there's another session that has, is concurrently starting that we all need to be a part of. So. Um, you know, clearly evident by the fact that you all stayed and folks um, um, lined up and, and the energy in this session, there's a tremendous need for these kinds of activities. And so what I want to leave you here is a plan that we started out with at the beginning, which is kind of twofold. One, I start off by recognizing all of the folks that have kind of built the, 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 the track that um, a lot of these folks are running fast on. And we want to make sure that we can connect all of you into a network that can help lift up other young folks. So there's a lot of great leaders in this room right now. You saw Woody earlier. Um, you know, Georges is here who runs the American Public Health Association. Kamara who has been um, writing and doing research and uh, building all of the blocks that we know and talk about when we talk about racism and healthcare and all these different folks. And what I want to talk about um, is just the fact that we want to connect the folks that we think 
um, should be connected to all of the folks um, that have the power and influence to help elevate their careers and kind of keep things moving. That's one of the things that I think is important is creating a network for the future leaders based um, to a large extent on the accomplishments of uh, folks who have done many things in the past. So that being said, Don, you'll hear from us in the future. Um, it's an idea that I think Joan and I have been um, percolating and working on. And we ask that if you really are committed um, to this issue of building a pipeline, um, that you stay committed with us and help create opportunities for a lot of the uh, future leaders who um, need those opportunities.